Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. Today I am here to talk about the origins of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and why there was no winner in the fiction or novel category in the first year that the Pulitzer Prizes were given. This is a Pulitzer Prize deep dive. If you follow along, you know that I am doing a Pulitzer Prize project in which I am reading every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. This video is part of that series. I will have timestamps for easy navigation down below to different parts of the conversation, as well as links to my other videos in this series so far. So feel free to check out the description box down below for more information. And I will also link a full blog post about this, which will have links to areas where I have gotten information. So if you want the receipts or like footnotes, things like that, check that out as well. Now, when the Pulitzer Prizes were first awarded in 1917, there was a fiction prize, which was then called the Pulitzer Prize for the novel on the slate, but it was not featured among the inaugural winners of the prize. The Pulitzer jury and board for that year decided to withhold the fiction prize until the following year when it was awarded for the first time to Ernest Poole for the book, His Family. This is particularly interesting as a year to look at in my Pulitzer project because I find the years in which no prize was given to be just as interesting as the years in which it was awarded in many cases. And because this limbo year when the fiction prize was intended but not actualized offers an opportunity to give some background on just what the Pulitzer Prize is and what it intends to do. So... How did it happen that no prize was given? What is the background of the Pulitzer Prizes? Is there a book that should have won in this inaugural year? And just why are the Pulitzer Prizes administered by Columbia University? Let's get into it. So who was the Pulitzer Prize named for and why is Columbia University involved? The Pulitzer Prizes are named for Joseph Pulitzer, who was a Hungarian-American politician and journalist known for his fierce competition with William Randolph Hearst. Could do a whole video just about that. We're not going to do it. Needless to say, that's who it is. The competition between both Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst led both men to pioneer the notion of luring in readers with sensationalism, sex, and crime, also known at the time as yellow journalism, now known as standard operating procedure. In Joseph Pulitzer's later years, declining health forced him to withdraw from his public roles and from the daily operation of his newspaper, which was called the New York World. That is where Columbia University comes into the picture and how we will eventually get to the creation of the Pulitzer Prizes. In 1892, Joseph Pulitzer approached Seth Lowe, who was at that time the president of Columbia University, in order to offer the money to set up the world's first dedicated school to journalism. Seth Lowe turned down this proposal, but a decade later, in 1902, Columbia University had a new president, Nicholas Butler. As an aside, because he's an interesting figure, Nicholas Butler would eventually be on the Pulitzer board for the first Pulitzer Prize and many of the prizes to come, and he later shared a Nobel Peace Prize with Jane Addams in 1931, quote, for their assiduous effort to revive the ideal of peace and to rekindle the spirit of peace in their own nation and in the whole of mankind, end quote. But it also bears noting that Nicholas Butler had a reputation as an anti-Semite because he restricted the number of Jewish students who could attend Columbia University, which caused its registration to drop precipitously. Butler also used his position as president of Columbia to become the de facto leader of the Pulitzer board, a position he sometimes exploited to get his way. A good example of this is the case of 1941, when Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls was selected as the winner, but Butler found the novel to be offensive. He persuaded the board to rescind its selection, and as a result, no prize was given for that year. That is a prime example as well of why I think the years in which no prize was given are just as interesting as the years in which there was a prize given. There's a lot of drama. You don't get a lot of the behind the scenes drama anymore, but back in the day, it seems like there was just a lot. Anyway, as you can guess, Butler was much more receptive to the idea of accepting Joseph Pulitzer's money to open a dedicated journalism school. In fact, Columbia University's School of Journalism remains one of the most prestigious in the world to this day. 
Joseph Pulitzer died in 1911 and left Columbia $2 million in his will. The Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism was opened the following year. And because it took so long from the time that Joseph Pulitzer first approached Columbia University to when he died and this actually became a reality, the Graduate School of Journalism was not the first dedicated school of journalism in the world. That honor went to the Missouri School of Journalism, which opened in 1908 at the urging of, you guessed it, Joseph Pulitzer. So now that we've covered who the Pulitzer Prizes are named for and why Columbia University is involved, let's talk about how the prizes started. So Joseph Pulitzer's will, which was written in 1904, allocated $250,000 out of that endowment, the total money that he left to Columbia University to open this graduate school for journalism in order to establish the Pulitzer Prizes, quote, as an incentive to excellence, end quote, as well as to create scholarships. So the idea for the Pulitzer Prizes was baked into Joseph Pulitzer's endowment to Columbia University to start this journalism school. While the journalism school opened the year after Joseph Pulitzer's death, it took about five years for the Pulitzer Prizes to be awarded for the first time in 1917. Joseph Pulitzer also stipulated that the arts, literature, and music should be included alongside journalism, which is why the Pulitzer Prize is not simply an award for reporting. Joseph Pulitzer also established that a board should oversee the administration of the Pulitzer Prize and that this board would have the power to make changes over time, which has allowed the Pulitzer Prize the flexibility to add and remove categories as well as to evolve with changing times. A good example of this is when the Pulitzer Prize was amended to include online journalism in 1997. They were very ahead of the curve in terms of recognizing the move to online reporting. They also recently added a category for audio reporting, which essentially allows them to recognize podcasts with a Pulitzer Prize. Joseph Pulitzer also gave the Pulitzer Board the power to overrule recommendations from the prize juries, perhaps inadvertently establishing the very quality that led to controversies like the aforementioned situation with Nicholas Butler and For Whom the Bell Tolls. Indeed, particularly in the early years of the prize, there seems to have been a very combative relationship between the fiction juries and the Pulitzer Board. The only recent example where a board went rogue publicly was the controversy surrounding the decision to not award a prize in 2012. That is one of the Pulitzer Prize deep dive videos that will be linked down below. I have a whole video about it and what I think should have won that year. Check it out. I encourage you to do so. The Pulitzer Prize can only be awarded to individuals and works that are properly submitted for the award. If a work is not submitted, it cannot be considered. And spoiler alert, that is why no prize was awarded for fiction in the first year of the Pulitzer Prize Awards. I'll expand on that in a little bit, but that's your little preview of what is to come. In fact, according to the Pulitzer website, only four prizes were given in 1917, reporting and editorial writing on the journalism side, history and biography on the arts and letters side. The following year, nine prizes were given, including the first ever fiction prize. In the early years of the Pulitzer Prize, you really do have to take into account that a work had to be submitted in order to be considered, especially if you are questioning why what now seems like an obvious selection did not win. The truth is, we don't know what was submitted. We don't know what was not submitted. There are a lot of authors and publishers and writers and journalists who did not take the Pulitzer Prize very seriously in the early years, so they didn't see much point in submitting themselves for the prize. It hadn't established itself. It didn't have any reputation at this point. It got that pretty quickly, but there's still a bit of a lag time. And we as the public do not have access to the Pulitzer Prize archives or their records. Boy, would I love to have access to that stuff. I would be a kid in a candy store. If anyone from the Pulitzer administration side is watching this, please let me see the receipts. I would love the notes, the records, all of it. It would make me so happy. But since we are members of the public, we don't have access to any of that information. We don't know what was submitted. We don't know what wasn't. And again, it was a long road to building a reputation where people wanted to be considered for a Pulitzer Prize. In fact, the Chicago Tribune refused to compete for the Pulitzer Prizes until 1961, because until that point, its editor-in-chief considered the Pulitzer Prizes to be nothing more than a mutual admiration society. 
that is the stigma that they had to overcome in order to be taken seriously as a prize. Now that we have talked a little bit about the first Pulitzer Prizes and who created them and why, let's talk about the first incarnation of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and how it has changed over time. The Pulitzer Prize for Fiction was originally known as the Pulitzer Prize for the Novel. It went by that name until 1948 when the prize was expanded to include short story collections and novellas in addition to novels. I tend to refer to it as the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, regardless of the year under discussion, just in order to keep it consistent. But I do think it is important to note this distinction because, again, until 1948, only novels could be considered for the Pulitzer Prize. Short story collections and novellas were deemed ineligible. The original mandate for the novel prize is as follows, and it was not without controversy. Quote, Annually, for the American novel published during the year which shall best present the wholesome atmosphere of American life and the highest standard of American manners and manhood. End quote. The controversy at the time centered around use of the word wholesome, which replaced the word whole from Joseph Pulitzer's will. It's a change that significantly alters the intention of the prize, shifting it into the murky waters of morality, not just how well a work best reflects American life or what is the most quality work from the year in question. And it definitely had an impact on how the board considered novels that were submitted because it was the application of the word wholesome that caused them to reject the jury's recommendation of the book Java Head in 1920 resulting in a year in which no Pulitzer Prize for the novel was awarded. The first time that the prize was not awarded, once it actually got started. In 1927, the board quietly replaced the word wholesome with whole to better reflect Pulitzer's intention. In 1929, the board subtracted the part about manners and manhood, so the new mandate read, quote, preferably one which shall best present the whole atmosphere of American life. End quote. In 1936, we got close to the current mandate of the Pulitzer Prize when it was changed to, quote, a distinguished novel published during the year by an American author, preferably dealing with American life. End quote. The shift away from the title Pulitzer Prize for the novel in 1948 is what brought us to the Pulitzer Prize's mandate for fiction as it stands today. Quote, for distinguished fiction published in book form during the year by an American author, preferably dealing with American life. If you are wondering what led to the shift to include short stories in 1948, like what was it about that year or that board or that jury that caused them to want to expand it, it's because the jury for that year wanted to award the prize to a collection of short stories for the first time, and the board agreed allowing James Mishner's Tales of the South Pacific to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction under the award's new name. That's how it happened. Now that we have talked generally about who the prize was named for, why Columbia is involved, how it got started, and how the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in particular was in its first incarnation and how it has evolved over time, let's start looking specifically at the prize year of 1917. And a quick note as we get into this, because... The Pulitzer Prizes, as a reminder, are awarded the year after the eligibility period. So when we are talking about Pulitzer Prizes for 1917, the eligibility period is 1916. So when we talk about the Pulitzer Prize for the novel for 1917, we are referring to books that were published in 1916. And I will include reminders of that as we get through the rest of the video. The key here, when we talk about why there was no fiction prize winner, in 1917 is that the Pulitzer Prize can only be awarded to a person or work that is properly submitted for consideration. The other contributing factor is that since this was a new prize that had not established a reputation, as we discussed, there were not a lot of submissions in the early days, and the Fiction Prize was particularly hamstrung by this, especially in the first year in which the Pulitzer Prizes were awarded. In fact, according to the book Chronicle of the Pulitzer Prizes for Fiction, only six novels were submitted for consideration in 1917. And again, the year in which those books were published was 1916. Here is a quote from the book Chronicle of the Pulitzer Prizes for Fiction. Quote, There were only six applicants for the prize, as the report of the jurors indicates verbatim, one of whom sent not a printed book but a manuscript, which fails to meet the requirement of publication during the year. 
Of the five books submitted in competition, all but one seemed to us unworthy of consideration for the prize. We are unanimously of the opinion, however, that the merits of this book, though considerable, are no greater than that of several other novels, which, though not included in the formal applications, have been taken into consideration by us in arriving at a verdict. We recommend, the jurors wrote furthermore, that the award be withheld this year. The advisory board and the trustees of Columbia University accepted the verdict of the jury and decided on no award in the fiction category, end quote. That is how we ended up without a fiction prize in the first year of the Pulitzer Prize Awards. So although we don't know the titles of the six books that were submitted, and again, I would love to have access to the records to find out. Anyway, although we don't know, know the titles of those books, we do know that one of them was ineligible. And of the other five books, only one was deemed to be a serious contender, and it was ultimately deemed to be inferior or not better than other books that were published in the year that were not submitted for consideration. I have discussed this before, but the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction seems uniquely focused on creating a canon of American literature. Historically, it is a prize that takes its reputation for identifying classics in real time very seriously. And this was even true in the first year the Pulitzer Prizes were given. So much so that the jury and the board decided that they would rather delay launching the prize for the novel than see it go to a work that they did not feel lived up to that standard. Perhaps that's why the Pulitzer Prize has been so successful for so long and why despite dips in quality here and there, it still holds a reputation among publishers, authors, critics, and readers as one of the most significant awards an American author can win. This is also why I feel the Pulitzer Prize is so inextricably linked to the quest for the great American novel and the question of whether or not it exists or could exist at all. I have a whole video discussing that. It will be in the description box down below. Please check it out if you are so inclined. It would have been easy to just give the prize to the one book that the jury deemed worthy of consideration. But the Pulitzer Prize was, and still is, to a large degree, concerned with legitimacy, which was certainly a huge concern for the United States in general at the time the prize was created. As a relatively new nation, the United States was struggling to be taken seriously by the rest of the developed world. Our art, including novels, was not taken seriously compared to the works of Europeans. In a sense, the Pulitzer Prize was also a way of fighting for the legitimacy of American artistry. It is not difficult, therefore, to see why the jury and the board would be so hung up on the idea of only putting the absolute best work possible on a pedestal for the world to consider. Now, before we get into the discussion of whether or not any particular book should have been considered for the Pulitzer Prize for this year, let's take a snapshot of what was going on in the world in 1916. And again, although the Pulitzer Prizes were awarded in 1917, the eligibility period for those prizes was 1916. That's why we're looking at events of 1916. In bookstores, according to Publishers Weekly, the best-selling book of 1916 was 17 by Booth Tarkington, who is significant because he would win the second Pulitzer Prize for the novel in 1919. He ultimately became one of only four people to win two Pulitzer Prizes for fiction. The Nobel Prize for Literature was awarded to a Swedish poet and prose writer named Werner von Heidenstam, quote, in recognition of his significance as the leading representative of a new era in our literature, end quote. In movies, there's not much to report since the movie industry was still new, but the highest grossing movie of 1916 was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and Mary Pickford became the first star to sign a million dollar contract. I'm not going to discuss television because it didn't exist at this point, and I'm not going to discuss music because it's really hard to pick music news for this year. It became much more of a thing later. In the news, World War I raged in Europe, dominated in 1916 by trench warfare and battles along the Western Front in France. The United States would not begin conscription until 1917, a year later. In the Mexican Revolution, Pancho Villa led 500 Mexican raiders in an attack on Columbus, New Mexico that resulted in the deaths of 12 American soldiers. 
and significantly, the Jersey Shore fell victim to a series of vicious shark attacks that inspired Peter Benchley to write the book Jaws, which was published in 1974 and became a classic movie the year after that. And the Chicago Cubs played their first game in what is now known as Wrigley Field, but at the time was known as Wiegman Park. That's what was going on in the world in 1916, the first year that was eligible for the Pulitzer Prizes. So what were the possible contenders for the Pulitzer Prize for the novel in 1917? Here's the thing. 1916, again, the year in which things were eligible for the Pulitzer Prize, was not a great year for American fiction. It's actually really not difficult at all to see why the jury struggled to find a worthy winner, even if it had gotten more submissions. It's interesting because looking back at the state of American publishing over a century later has both the benefit and the curse of hindsight. The benefit is that we've had enough time to adequately measure the long-term success of a book or an author. We can pick and choose the books that have stood the test of time. The curse of hindsight is that we don't have access to the context of the time. We can't relate to what was going on and we don't have the knowledge of all of the things that were happening that a person living in 1916 would have had. There are writers who were enormously popular at the time in the early days of the Pulitzer who have faded into obscurity in the decades since. Consider Lewis Bromfield, who won the 1927 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for his book, Early Autumn. In the 1920s, Lewis Bromfield was a best-selling author. By the end of the 1930s, he had reinvented himself as a farmer and an early advocate of the environmental movement, and his reputation as a writer steadily faded away. Today, unless you ask a Pulitzer enthusiast, you are unlikely to find anyone who even knows who Lewis Bromfield is. And ironically, given the Pulitzer Board's focus on identifying classic literature in real time, the same is true for Ernest Poole and the book that won the very first Pulitzer Prize for the novel, His Family. I think you would be hard-pressed to find someone who's not a Pulitzer enthusiast in today's world, in the general public, who knows who Ernest Poole is. 1916 in literature is a year where I feel like the context of the time is necessary in order to parse through the competition. There are no identifiable classics to a modern reader among the American books that were published that year. All of the classic literature from this year, such as A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, came from other parts of the world. I would love to tell you that I think I know which book the Pulitzer jury considered to be the most likely for this year, but honestly, I can't even hazard a guess. It's that bleak. Since the field is not that big, let's talk about some of the contenders. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. Zane Grey published The Border Legion, which is described as, quote, the story of a cold-hearted man named Jack Kells who falls in love with Miss Joan Randall, a girl his legion has taken captive near the Idaho border, end quote. I've never heard of this book. I have heard of Zane Grey. And while he is one of the most popular Western writers of the 20th century, I don't hear much about the quality of his writing, so I can't imagine they were talking about him as the possible contender. Then you have Booth Tarkington, who again went on to win two Pulitzer Prizes for the novel. He published two books in this eligible year, 1916. The first was Penrod and Sam, the other is 17. Penrod and Sam is a sequel to an earlier work by Booth Tarkington called Penrod. Penrod and Sam is about the friendship between the title characters. It does not sound like a very likely contender to me. 17, the full title of which is 17, A Tale of Youth and Summertime and the Baxter Family, especially William, is a humorous satire of first love and was the best-selling novel of the year. So, I mean, maybe? I genuinely don't know. Sherwood Anderson's Windy McPherson's son seems like the likeliest of potential contenders, but this semi-autobiographical novel is largely forgotten in favor of Sherwood Anderson's later short story collection, which would have been ineligible for the Pulitzer Prize for the novel because it is a short story collection called Winesburg, Ohio, which just makes it really difficult to say. It sounds like it could be a contender, but I just don't know how to measure that. Then you have The Grizzly King by James Oliver Kerwood which sounds like a potential candidate, but even the Wikipedia page for that book 
only mentions that it was the inspiration for the 1988 French film The Bear, and I don't even really know anything about that French film called The Bear. So I don't really don't know where that leaves me with this book. I don't know anything else about it, except it looks like Kerwood was a best-selling author at the time who had become a conservationist, and he was actually the highest-paid author in the world, per word, at the time of his death in 1927 at age 49. So, maybe? Again, I really just don't know. There was also a posthumous Mark Twain novel, but would they have seriously considered a largely unfinished work of Mark Twain that had been published years after his death? The whole year feels really inaccessible to me, and being honest, the pickings, they are really slim. Really slim. Which takes us to the ultimate question in this Pulitzer Prize deep dive for the first year in which the Pulitzer Prizes were awarded. Should anything have won the Pulitzer Prize for the novel in 1917? This might sound like a cop-out, but I'm going to say that the Pulitzer jury and board were right to delay the launch of the Fiction Prize by a year. Any one of the contenders that I mentioned would have been forgotten anyway, and it's exceedingly difficult to pretend to parse through the options as a modern reader who has not read the books and is largely unfamiliar with the authors in question. In order to do so, I would have to spend a lot of time finding these books, tracking them down, researching the authors, reading the books, and I'm not about to do that right now. If you have knowledge of any of these authors and books from this year, let me know in the comment section down below. If you know of a book that you would make a case for from 1916, let me know in the comment section down below. I would love to hear it. But being honest, I just don't have the context or the knowledge of these authors and books to make an informed decision about if anything should have won. So I am just going to say that the Pulitzer jury and the board were right when they decided to delay the launch of the Pulitzer Prize for the novel by a year. Again, I just think this is a really interesting year, and for many reasons, I think the years in which the Pulitzer Prize for the novel, now the Pulitzer Prize for the fiction, is not awarded are just as interesting as the years in which it is given. And it really stands with my mission in my Pulitzer Prize project, where I don't want to just read the books that won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. I want to try to understand the context of why a particular book won the Pulitzer Prize at the time that it did, what it means, and what it means when a book did not win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and especially in the years in which the prize was not awarded. And again, 1917, the year in which the Pulitzer Prizes were awarded, is really fascinating because the Pulitzer Prize was sort of in limbo when it came to the fiction prize. They had decided that there would be a prize for fiction or for the novel at the time, but it was not actualized until the following year. And I just find that fascinating. And I should tell you, I had thought that I knew what direction I was going to go in for my next read for my Pulitzer Prize project. And I have changed my mind. I'm going to go in a different direction. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to pick this book up soon. And that's a tease because I'm not going to tell you what the book is. But I'm hoping I will get to it soon. And stay tuned for that. Hopefully, I will again, it will be coming up shortly. So if you have thoughts about anything I've talked about, again, if you would like to make a case for a book, let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.